First up, we have Boris. Hi, hello, I'm Boris from France, from Mulderville. Hello, Cal Patrick and Sam. We are so proud to talk with the two great uh, Army King directors. What can you tell us about your collaboration on the second series, season, sorry, Cal as a new director and Sam as an executive producer? Thank you. Um, you know, honestly, uh, the idea was is that every season sort of had its own director and its own uh, vision. And because the second season was was already shifting uh, point of view uh, from Heidi, from Julia Roberts' character, Heidi, to Janelle Monae's character, uh, Jackie, in the second season. And because we, it was sort of going now outside of the world of the homecoming experiment to the larger picture of Geis, we really just wanted to find a director that was gonna bring his own sort of his or her own unique vision to the story and kyle uh kyle was just the perfect person for that and uh, he totally understood the material uh understood the dna of what i was trying to do in the first season but um but then also sort of subvert or uh or or evolve it into a different way uh, to tell the story of the second season um and yeah that's how we uh that's how we kind of uh that's how we kind of um, anticipated even going into the first season, how the second season would work, that we would need somebody with a different uh, vision and different sensibility to take over. And Kyle was that, was that guy. Amandi? Yes, hi, I'm Amandine from France. Uh, I have a question for you both. How did you get like, um, ready did you have any challenge when you direct the first season and it was a success do you have any challenges for the second one so you feel like pressure to do as much good as the first one <laughs> <laughs> uh well i'll just quickly say for the first season um i think there was an enormous amount of pressure um weirdly um you know the podcast was obviously great um, and so I really wanted, I mean, there was a, a pressure from my end to make sure I didn't screw this up. As a fan of movies and TV shows, I always get frustrated when adaptations of great material um, don't translate or they feel redundant. Um, in fact, it was, the, it, was, it was the latter that I was really concerned about. I did not want to neither tar tarnish the original podcast, but also um, wanted to make sure that we did something unique and different that justified the television series. Um, also, we had Julia Roberts in her, her first starring role in, in a television series. So um, there was a lot of pressure to make sure I do right by her. Um, I think that I speak for me and the entire crew and Eli and Micah when I say that. Um, she's such an amazing presence. We all grew up watching her and being huge fans of her. So we wanted to make sure that, um, that, we did, that this project stayed as special as it could and um, and yeah, yeah, there was an enormous amount of pressure going into the first season, but I will say in making it and shooting it, there was just uh, an electricity on set every day that regardless of how it was received, I think we, we all felt pretty good about the work we did. I'll let Kyle address season two. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was definitely fueled by um, to live up to season one, but also... In a weird way, everything said translates to season two just in a different way. I was trying to not be redundant to season one, right? And I was trying to also not take away from what season one did so well. So a lot of those same feelings, it's sort of interesting to hear that because those were a lot of the similar feelings going on in my head. And that led to a lot of decisions, even to how scenes would look or how performances would feel, making sure that we were bringing new uh, qualities to the show, you know, new things for people to discover as opposed to just giving you more of the same. And, um, and that started with the scripts and the, you know, and the scripts being taking on a different scope. Um, and also that pressure to do, to do right by Janelle, to do right by Chris Cooper and Joan Cusack, you know, to, to, and, and to the fans of the first season too. Lorenzo? Congratulations. Uh, I'm curious because uh, our uh, first season was just so amazing. Did you have like loads of movie stars asking you, begging you to be part of the second season? Well, I don't think it, it, it doesn't really, I would say it doesn't really operate like that. I think we, you know, we had to go away and decide what the second season was. 
And, um, and so there wasn't really anybody to raise their hand because they, they didn't know what character we were going to go with or what storyline we were going to go with. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then after we sort of cracked the, the, the season, then we just immediately went out. But Janelle, uh, to be honest with you, uh, I mean, we just got so lucky with her. She's not only one of the biggest uh, stars in the world, she's got an amazing presence and, you know, her acting chops are off the charts. So, um, uh, you know, she, we, we, we got pretty lucky pretty early on. It's kind of the same way first season happened, by the way. Julia was, she, you know, she was the, the the first person we went to and she said she listened to the podcast, said yes. Um, so in that regard, I think it was, you know, yeah, we, we, we got pretty, uh, pretty lucky. Yeah, it helped, you know, the first season being so good when you go to an actor like Chris Cooper, you know, it gets their interest a little more, right? They can see what it's going to be. And Chris and Joan were also the first people we went to. I mean, we did it. I've never had that experience before where usually it's a cast a little bit of fate and destiny and all those things intertwined. Um, and this, in this case, it just, it was, a, uh, it was a gift because everyone we had in mind, you know, wanted to do it. And Joe, I imagine. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in your um, connection to this, this sci-fi genre. You guys, you both of you have had some incredible projects, and so I want to ask about your early influences. Like, what what are some of your earliest connections to sci-fi? Like, um, was it in the TV shows, or um, when you were younger, or did it come like later on, or? What are some of your earliest influences? I mean, I'll just quickly say, um, when it came to film, it was less sci-fi, although, you know, I think 2001, I put up there as one of my favorite movies of all time, but it was more the, the thriller genre. And that's, I honestly, I don't think when we, when we talked about Homecoming, we don't think about it in that same way. And, you know, we don't, I don't know if we even throughout the world sci-fi once we always talked about it as a paranoid thriller but when you think about those movies and I'll, I'll name a few like parallax view or three days of the condor well let's specifically talk about parallax view there is the hint that there's something near future about those things that something insidious is happening that that maybe takes a little it veers off reality a little bit slightly um, but but really, it's it's about keeping it grounded and keeping it about the characters and less about um, any sort of sci-fi, uh, the, the, any sort of um, the sci-fi elements. Um, you know, the other the other sort of influences I would throw out there is obviously Twilight Zone. Alfred Hitchcock presents well, the latter specifically because again, Twilight Zone could whereas Twilight Zone could be heady and really talk about. Uh, the 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 concepts in the same way that Black Mirror sort of geniusly does. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents was really more about characters and what lives inside them and the mysteries of of, of just humanity. And, I, and to me, that's what always resonated and, and feels more of a connection to what I tried to do in Homecoming. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I've got a 2001 tattoo. You know, my movie too. So in a lot of ways. There's always going to be that influence when I mean, we're in an all white room behind us, you know, all of that. But yeah, it was uh, for me, really, um, if Pacula was a little, or Pacula, I always, I always say, it was a little bit of the North Star uh, in season one, obviously, with like with Parallax View. Um, for me, I was kind of this season trying to look a little towards the Palma, maybe. We didn't have um, our story in season two isn't as fueled with the tone or feeling of paranoia, right? So this is, it's fueled a little bit more with this um, grandiose uh, journey that Jackie's going on. So I was sort of thinking, I had, I tried to have him in my, in my head a little bit during some of it. Uh, I say with that with humility, of course. Um, but in terms of the approach, uh, sort of a mix of what they were doing in season one and then throwing in a little bit more uh, we have some carry in there. We've, you know, we've got some blowout in there, uh, and just trying to sort of subtly take inspiration, uh, maybe not so subtly, and sometimes take inspiration from, from how De Palma would be shooting something in the in the eighties. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah, 
Yeah, hi. Uh, my question to both of you uh, is that, uh, you know, what were the thematic elements that you both have tried to uh, preserve in the second season? And were any, uh, were any of those elements uh, there that you wanted to leave behind as well? Yeah, I, for me, it was, um, thema well, I think plot-wise, it was branching off from this idea of memory loss and how you respond to that and how that uh, drug literally can be manipulated by powerful people. Um, but I think thematically, I think season two is very much about with ambitions. I um, mean, you'll see as the, as the season unfolds, but it's sort of about, um, you know, the Icarus quality. Right, you can want to do something and be the best at something and be so good at something, and that can come back and bite you in the ass. So you know, Jackie is, is fueled by that. Temple is certainly fueled in a lot of ways. Leonard is feeling the fallout of his own ambition and not controlling them. So it, the, the, that, to me, is the thing that unified all these girls. Yeah, I will. I will throw in there that thematically, and this weirdly connects. I think with through all, it's a through line through all my work, definitely with Mr. Robot and Connor, but he, with the first season of Homecoming, and I think as we go into the second season, identity becomes a really big theme in terms of characters really looking inward and asking who they are. I mean, literally the beginning of the second season is a person trying to find out uh, who, who they literally are. Um, and that's something I, you know, for me, I know as I think about it, they think about why I'm fascinated by that theme. I think it's something I think we're all grappling with, um, especially in this age where we can kind of curate and create our identities online and, um, and sort of fragment them into these different subsets, right? You are different on Facebook than you are on Twitter than you are in person. Uh, then, um, uh, then you are posting on a blog or whatever, or commenting on something. So, I, for whatever reason, that theme has uh, has particular resonance with me, and I, f I feel like with um, with Homecoming season one, where we sort of touched upon that a little bit. I think uh, Kyle, Eli, and Micah just kind of went to the next level in, in, in the second season, where it becomes actually about the I mean, it becomes the plot and the theme uh, simultaneously. We have room for just one more question. Anybody want to raise your hand and ask? Who wants to ask the last question? All right, Boris, thank you. When we look at the two seasons, we think about the great Hitchcock movies and the music take an important place in these movies. What can you tell us about the use of this music on the two seasons, please? Well, season one was uh, Sam did this really ingenious thing of using, using old movie scores. And so for season two, um, you know, I wasn't uh, trying, I loved that. I wasn't trying to be defiant uh, to not do that, but more that um, I think uh, I, I think it would have been dangerous to try to pull it off again. I think it would have maybe turned what was a really novel and smart thing in season one and actually might've reduced it to a gimmick because it was, uh, you know, same with the ratio changes, right? You don't wanna, you don't wanna, you, those were so driven by the story and so driven by, the choices in Heidi that I, if you just replicate those just to replicate them, you trivialize them. And so one of the things we tried to do for season two was bring a composer on. And that was one of the first things that we did. And it was a really, you know, it's a tough decision because the music, unlike a lot, not a lot of television is, is music driven. And, and this show really was, right? The music can play big and the music can play over a scene and sometimes be more important than a scene. And when you do that, that means you have to have really good music and TV schedules are really fast and it can be really hard to have really special music. So we um, pushed really hard. We recorded with a live score, uh, live orchestra, you know, which isn't done um, and hired this composer, Mary, uh, who just blew it out of the water. I'd loved his score for uh, his first score. This is his second score, really. So his first score was for um, The Last Black Man in San Francisco, a movie that came out last year. And it was one of my favorite scores I'd heard in a long time. And so hiring him was 
there is always a little bit of risk in the best hires. And in this case, um, it really paid off. And it's one of the things I'm proudest of of the season is the score that feels, it feels referential. So it feels like you're getting a little bit of the qualities of season one in there, but allow, but he, you know, had enough confidence to let it become its own thing too. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.